Presbyterian Church. We are so happy that you can join us today. My name is Sherry Phillips and I'm one of the elders here at our church. If you're interested to seeing what's going on at our church, check out our website at www.amberleychurch.ca. We have lots of programs happening and some summer things will be happening too. Virtual camp in the box and some other items. Check us out. We'd like to thank you for all the support you've given us during this time, especially during COVID. So we really appreciate it. If you would like to donate to our church, you can check out our website and there's many options there. We now offer an e-transfer option too, which makes it really simple. If you like, you can always drop off your donation at the church. We have a locked mailbox there for you. So today we are happy to hear from Dr. Reverend Mona Scrivens and her message. Let's do the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, welcome back, Amberly. Uh, today is Father's Day, and I would like to begin today uh, by offering a special prayer. Would you join me as we pray? Creator God, we give thanks for the fathers in our lives. Fatherhood does not come with a manual, <laughs> and reality teaches us that some fathers excel while other fathers do not. And we ask for your blessings for them all, and forgiveness where it is needed. This Father's Day, we remember the many sacrifices fathers make for their children and families, and the ways, both big and small, they lift children to achieve dreams thought beyond reach. So too we remember all those who have helped fill the void when fathers pass early or are absent. Grandfathers and uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors and coaches, and the women of our families. For those who are fathers, we ask for wisdom and humility in the face of the task of parenting. Give them the strength to do well by their children and by you. In your holy name we pray, O oh God. Amen. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Okay, so we are in part two of a series entitled, Don't Forget to Remember Not to Forget. Important, right? Um, and what we're going to do right now is I'm going to read you a portion of scripture. And I'm telling you, it's a little bit lengthy, but each and every word is important. So listen, it's, it's Mark 5, verses 21 to 43. Follow along if you like. Close your eyes if you like. But let me, um, let me read to you this incredible story, this passage of scripture uh, filled uh, with richness. Okay, it goes like this. Verse 21. When Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet, you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing that what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, and trembling with fear, told him the, tr the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came to the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. 
Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they had said, Jesus told him, do not be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother, brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they all laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with them and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. A long passage, for sure, but so rich and so good. This morning, what I want to do is I want to hone in on two verses, verses 40 and 41, where it says, but they laughed at him. <laughs> they, they laughed, you know? And, and you might want to want, you know, might want to ask, well, who are they? Well, they are the negative, doubting, unbelieving, faithless, cantankerous people. You know who those people are, right? The ones who light up a room when they leave. You know what I'm talking about? Those people who, for every solution, they will find a problem. Uh, that, that's who they are, right? And it says, they laughed at him. And it says, after he, that's Jesus, put them all out. And you think, whoa, right? Jesus, like, kicked him out. In fact, um, the Greek suggests that he physically, you know, put them out. To all of those negative, doubting, unbelieving people who are messing up the atmosphere and the environment, he says, sorry, guys, you got to get out, right? You got to get out. And once they got out, then he went to the little girl and said, get up. Amberly, I, I just wonder if the power of a miracle is not just in the miracle itself, but rather in the atmosphere and the environment that surrounds it. Could it be possible that, that you know, we've been looking at situations, you, you've been looking at situations in your life and telling them, you know, get up, right? Get up. But it's actually the season in your life to start checking your environment and maybe to tell some things to get out. I, I love this passage because it's, it's like it's two stories in one, isn't it? And, and it's, it's all about connection. We're all connected. Here's something crazy talking about connections. My parents were um, my parents were both born in India. And shortly after they got married, um, they moved to Saskatchewan, where my dad was offered a position um, uh, as a professor of microbiology at the University of Saskatoon. Okay, so get this. I was born in, in Saskatoon, and I was delivered by C-section. Now, Brian's parents were born and raised in, in Saskatchewan, and it turns out that the obstetrician that delivered me, get this, was Brian's uncle. Ah! Right? Is that not a crazy connection? And, and the divine intersection and the collision of characters in the scripture that I just read is just as crazy because their connection is, is not one that is easily seen on the surface. But once you begin to peel back the layers, it becomes clear that every single one of us does not have the luxury of autonomy. We are deeply connected. Miracles merge with miracles. Testimonies have a way of touching each other. We are all connected. It's, it's powerful to understand that our lives are not straight lines, but actually links, because all of us are deeply and intrinsically connected. In fact, this pandemic has shown us that we are more connected, right? More connected than we realize. The text today, um, Mark begins by, by talking about a synagogue leader by the name of Jairus. And, and when Mark starts talking about, you know, 
he then starts talking about um, this woman with this, this blood issue. And the reason Mark merged these two stories together is because the two of them are connected. In fact, to talk about Jairus, the synagogue leader, and never discuss the woman with the issue of blood is really to do an injustice to this passage because the two of them are deeply connected, but not on the surface. If you look at the surface, they couldn't be further apart. They're, they couldn't be more opposite. Like, first of all, Jairus is a man and, and, and she is a woman. Different, right? Jairus um, is named in the text, but this woman doesn't, you know, the text does not give her a name. Um, Jairus is a ruler of a Jewish, a Jewish synagogue, and this woman can't even come near the synagogue because her sickness has made her ceremonially unclean. The culture would suggest that Jairus is affluent, that he's got money, right? And this woman is poor because she spent her last penny on doctors. Jairus is a Habs fan, and, and this woman is a diehard Leafs fan, even still. And they're just completely opposite. They have absolutely nothing in common on the surface, but life has put them in the exact same place and position because they both have been hit with something that they knew they could not handle. Life has a way of evening the playing field. Life has a way of, of hitting you on the upside of the head with some stuff that your money can't fix, that your friends can't fix. And I dare say that we're in the middle of something like, of that, like that right now. Life has a way of taking your breath away. Life has a way of, of, of making an atheist say, oh God, I need you right now. Life can hit you with things that you cannot handle. And might I suggest, if you're watching this today and you've been hit with something that, that you can't handle, that means this is a thing, this is a job for Jesus. It's time for you to just throw up your hands and say, God, I don't know what to do about this. Surely you can do something. Now look at Jairus and this woman. Nothing in common on the surface, but both ended up in the same position, having to push people out of the way to get an appointment with Jesus. And I love that neither one of them had a pretty pathway with, with rose petals to Jesus, right? But both had to be inconvenienced and, and push people out, excuse me, you know, push people out of the way to get something that they have, you know, that they never got before. You know why they're pushing? I'll tell you why they're pushing. They both had to push to get to Jesus because desperate people do desperate things. When you are desperate for God, we approach, we approach God differently. When you're really desperate for God, you don't care what other people think about, you know, you lifting your hands up in worship. When, when you're desperate for God, you'll pray three times a day. When, you know, in fact, let me be clear about this something. God did not send this pandemic, but he is using this pandemic to wake some people up out of their lethargic attitude and complacent Christianity saying, you need to get desperate for me, desperate to see change in your family, desperate to see a change in a generation. Desperation will open up doors that complacency keeps shut. There's something about being desperate. And I love that it was desperation that brought Jairus and this woman both to the feet of Jesus. Jairus gets there first and, and, and boy, oh boy, is he desperate, right? He's desperate because his little girl, his baby girl is dying. And he gets to Jesus and he's not casually approaching Jesus. He's panic stricken. He's desperate. This woman is just as desperate. But her situation's been going on for a long time. She's been hemorrhaging. That's, that's a, there's a hemorrhaging that's occurring in her body. And, and watch how much Mark, the gospel writer, wants us to know that the two of them are connected. This woman, well, because the little, the, the little girl, Jairus' little girl who is dying is 12 years old. And this woman that's been dealing with this issue of, of blood has been dealing with it for. 12 years, a 12-year-old girl dying and a 12-year-old disease. 
So chronologically speaking, the same year that this little girl was born is the exact year that this woman was probably diagnosed with her disease. Mark chapter 5. If it was a movie, you know, with the producers of This Is Us, um, and they were making a movie, the scene would would flash from, from the feet of Jesus and then pan, you know, say 12 years earlier. And then they would go to a hospital to shoot it on a scene. And walking out of the hospital, you with me? Walking out of the hospital would be Jairus and his wife. And they would be holding their brand new baby girl. And they'd have that weird, goofy look, you know, that silly parent look as they're, they're casting a, a, a look down on their baby, right? And then coming out from the same hospital, is a woman, tears rolling down her face because she has just been diagnosed with a disease that doctors don't know what to do about. And just maybe they were at the same hospital that day, but they didn't see each other. Isn't that just like life? Isn't that just like us today? I find that sometimes we can be so preoccupied with, with, with our pain and our suffering or even a promise or a, a duty or, or whatever it is that we don't see people around us. That you can just walk past people that God actually wants to use us to bless them. You know, I, it, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how, how much pain we're in or, or how, you know, how focused we are on the task at hand. Don't let, don't let it make you become oblivious to other people around you that God actually might use you to speak life into them. See, we've forgotten Romans chapter 12 that says you have to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So thank God for Jesus that made both of them joined, right? 12 and 12 and now there are two 12s that are touching. And I think we know it, that, that there are some numbers in the Bible that are important. 12, 12 is one of those numbers. 12 is a big number to God. God began his covenant with his people, a covenant that began by calling out Abraham, his son, Isaac, and Jacob. And guess how many sons Jacob had? 12 sons to remind him of the covenant, the promise with their God. And those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 is a big number. You remember in the Old Testament, the, the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies with a breastplate on that had 12 precious stones on it, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Now you fast forward to the New Testament and the first time we see Jesus teaching in the temple, he's at the tender age of 12, right? And, and all those listening are marveled at how this junior high kid had so much power and wisdom. 12 is a big number. Do you know that 12 signifies in the Bible God's power and it's the number of God's authority? Do you know that Jesus is saying with the power of, of the twelves, he's saying, I don't care what sickness, disease, calamity, or problem that's in your life. There is absolutely nothing you're facing that is not under the jurisdiction of my power and my authority. He's saying through the twelve, I have the power to handle whatever is coming against you. That's why he called twelve disciples. And if it was me, I would probably just call 11, right? Goodbye, hater, right? I wouldn't call Judas, but not Jesus. He called 12 and he gave them power and authority. 12 is a number of power. It's the number of authority. Now, why is that important? It's important because it is your awareness of God's authority in your life that will determine how much you will receive from God. You know, see, often we look at a passage like this and we reduce it to faith because Jesus said, daughter, your faith has healed you. And we know faith is important, right? Faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is our anchor. Nobody takes an anchor and just throws it in the water. You're, you're, you're going to lose the anchor. You better connect it. You got to tie it, the anchor to something. And watch this. My faith is connected to his authority and the authority of his word and the authority of his 
his power to know that Jesus has the final say. If you don't connect your faith to God's authority, you're, you're going to have a problem. See, some of us think we have a faith problem. Like, oh, Mona, I haven't had my breakthrough because I, I just don't have enough faith. Or I haven't, I haven't got a miracle. My faith is not good enough. I didn't pray enough. It's just, it's just my faith, right? Now, what if your faith is good? Because all you need is faith of a mustard seed. It's never the size of your faith. It's the object of your faith. And once you connect your faith to God's authority, your faith will go to a whole other level. But if you don't believe God is the ultimate authority, then your faith will struggle. Now notice the disciples. They're on the boat and the winds, they, you know, they start to get crazy. They start picking up. And these disciples are on the boat and they're having a panic attack. Like many of us are right now in the middle of this pandemic. And, and so they're thinking, what, what are we going to do? What are, what are we going to do? And Jesus is just chillaxing right? In the bottom of the boat. And the disciples are like, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to die. And Jesus gets up. He's calm, cool, and collected. And he just goes up to the edge of the boat and says, peace, be still. And in that moment, the winds and the waves and everything is calm. And the disciples drop their jaw and go, well, who is this man? You know, Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Now, what did Jesus say back? Oh, you of little faith, right? You know why you're shocked? Jesus is, you know, I can imagine Jesus saying, you know why you're shocked? Because you didn't know how much authority I had. You, you, you should have looked at me when I was asleep at the bottom of the boat. And you should have walked up and said, who is this man who is sleeping and snoring in the middle of a hurricane? If the storm isn't bothering him, it's not going to bother me. Scoot over, Jesus. Let me cuddle with you because if you're not stressed about this situation, why should I be stressed about this situation? God is not in heaven having a panic attack right now. God doesn't have anxiety. So you can sleep at night when you trust God's authority, you don't have a faith problem. You have an awareness of his authority problem. And it is my earnest prayer that in the midst of this chaos and craziness in the world, that God would actually strengthen our faith because we will get a fresh awareness of his authority. That God has the final say no matter what's going on. Connect your faith to God's authority. So Jairus got a house call from Jesus because that was his awareness of his authority. Don't forget, Jairus worked in the synagogue, right? And he, he's basically a pastor. And so he approached Jesus like a pastor would. He said, you know, Jesus, sir, Jesus, please, would, would you come to my house? My, my daughter is about to die. I need you to come and lay hands over her. We've got a worship band ready. And we, you know, just come and lay hands. And, and we know, I know she will be healed. And Jesus is like, cool. You want me to come to your house? Cool, I'll, I'll come to your house. And they start, they start walking on their way. This woman had a whole other awareness of his authority. She's like, Jesus, you don't have time to come to my house. I don't have time for that. All you have to do or all I have to do is touch the hem of your garment. And if I touch the hem of your garment, I know I am going to be made whole. And that's what she got. You know why? Because that was her awareness of his authority. You don't have a faith problem. We don't have a faith problem. We have an awareness of his authority problem. I think this is so important as it relates to the building of our faith. Because if we don't believe that somebody ha somebody's the ultimate authority, we will doubt the validity of their words. And you serve a God that says, I am the word. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've been there. I've been there. You know, you've been to a place of business. Maybe it's a store or a hotel and the clerk can't answer or fix whatever problem there is. And you say politely, can I speak to your manager? Right. And the manager comes out and fixes the problem. Boom, boom. And for the trouble gives you 10% off or upgrades you to the executive, the executive suite. Right. When you're lying awake at night, 
stressed by what's going on in the world, I hope, I pray, you will just lift up your hands and say, I want to speak to the supervisor. I need to speak to the God of heaven and earth. I need to speak to the Alpha and Omega. I need to speak to the beginning and the end. I want to speak to the one who spoke the world into existence. I want to speak to the God who has authority. God has authority. You don't have a faith problem. You have an awareness of God's authority problem. Know who has the authority. This woman goes for 12 years. You know, I've been, I've been speaking to mid-level employees, she said. I demand an appointment with a supervisor. She touched, she touched the hem of his garment and immediately she was healed. But the miracle doesn't stop there because don't forget this, this woman and Jairus are connected. Don't forget that before this, this woman was an interruption to Jesus' journey to Jairus' house. She was an interruption, just like what's going on in our world right now. This is the biggest interruption. But sometimes, sometimes interruptions are invitations for a miracle. But Jesus was approached by Jairus first. He said, Jesus, you got to come to my house. Please, my daughter is dying. Time was of the essence. Jesus did not have time to waste. Like, hurry up. And I can see Jesus going through the crowd and Jairus is probably, you know, leading him, you know, going forward. Come on, come on, I'll show you where my house is. Come, come follow me, Jesus. Come on, hurry, hurry up. He's gotten through the crowd of people. He's, he's forcing his way through the, and he checks back to, to, to see whether Jesus is still back in the crowd. And all of a sudden he, he looks back and, and he's lost Jesus in the crowd. You know, where did he go? I, I mean, I told him this is an emergency. Time is of the essence. What is he doing? And all of a sudden, he finds Jesus surrounded by people talking about who touched me. And Jairus is like, are you serious right now? I mean, I just told you this is an emergency. What, what do you mean? Who touched you? Everybody's touching you, Jesus. And isn't it frustrating when God makes you wait? Not only does he stop, Jesus waits for this woman to come out of the crowd. I mean, how long did it take for her to sheepish, sheepishly, you know, come through and admit, oh, it was me. And and it's and he starts talking to her. And like Jairus has to wait. And, and I can just see steam coming out of his ears. You know, are you serious? Are you kidding me right now? And the Bible says that Jesus let her tell him the whole story. Right? And, and if you've ever had another woman tell you her whole story, it, it may have taken some time. And I imagine Jairus, oh my goodness, woman, get your healing and go, right? We, we, we got to get to my house. And it's frustrating when God makes you watch a miracle while you're waiting on your miracle. Isn't it frustrating to watch other people get a promotion and you lost your job? To watch other people post pictures of, of, of their baby on Instagram and Facebook and you can't have a child yourself? What do you do when, when Jesus makes you watch a miracle while you're waiting on your miracle? God will often make you watch a miracle while you're waiting for your miracle. And it's not to discourage you. It's to encourage you, to let you know that if God did it for them, God can do it for you too. It might not be the same way, but if you'll just trust God and know that God has all power and all authority. That's why God was able to heal this woman then, and then even go to the house when Jairus thought that all hope was lost and say, do not be afraid. Just believe. He walks all the way to the house. They already started the funeral and Jesus goes, why y'all crying? girl's not dead. She's just asleep. And they laughed at him. He says, oh, you think that's funny, do you? Everyone, every one of you that laughed, I got a word. Get out. Hear that? This might be your season to start doing some cleaning and start checking your environment and telling some things enough is enough. You got to get out. Somebody needs to tell fear to get out. 
to tell anxiety to get out. It feels like the world has stopped. Everybody is on pause. And before life resumes, which will be very soon, maybe we have an opportunity to check our environment. Some things that you've been putting up with for a long time that may need to get out. Maybe a relationship. Maybe negative thoughts. Replace it with the word of God. Tell that thought of giving up to get out. Tell that thought that God has abandoned you to get out. Because God is with you. Even in the pain, even in the struggle, trust God and know that God has all power and all authority. Amen? Amen. Would you join me as we pray? Father, I pray that we don't forget to remember that you are in charge that you have all power and that you have all authority. You have the final say at, and it is in God we trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray you'll join us again next week. In the meantime, be well, be safe. The Lord bless you and keep you.